Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan. And I'm Alex. And uh, Alex, uh, have you gotten into any fights lately? Uh, only with you. Only with me? Uh, and they were over pretty quickly. Yeah, you pass out really fast. Oh, that's that's good. Uh, but hey, uh, wouldn't it be cool if you could actually like fight in a game? Uh, yes. Well, well, you're in luck. <laughs> Go figure. I mean, you can can you believe it? But we actually have with us today. We're very pleased to say, uh, Mr. Brian Wolf, who has just successfully kickstarted a game called Tiny Sword Smash. And Brian, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me on. Oh, you're you're very welcome. And um, the reason I mentioned fighting is because uh, Tiny Sword Smash. I think that's how I actually have to say it every time. Yeah, uh, uh, basically at the top of your lungs. You know, if you don't sound like uh, if you don't sound like you're about to like kick somebody like 500 feet in the air, it's probably not mm. correct. Oh, okay, good, good, good you to know. A, you got an incredible Hulk then. You got an incredible Hulk. Smash. That's pretty good. Okay. Uh, but it, it's, it's sort of in the vein of like almost a Smash Brothers style game, but as a board game that you can play with two to four people. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Uh, very much. And that's the best way to describe it. It is, for all intents and purposes, a Smash Brothers board game. Now, why? I mean, uh, first of all, I like that idea. But second of all, I would not have come up with that idea. How did you come up with that idea? Well, it's kind of a weird journey because the original draft of this game, uh, when it was originally called Tiny Swords Tactics, was very, very different. Uh, mechanically, actually started as this little card game inspired by Final Fantasy, uh, which is part of where these cute little 16-bit style monster sprites came from. Uh, mm -hmm. But as I was developing this, uh, I was interested in these cards kind of shifting back and forth and attacking different directions. And as uh, playtesters were kind of taking the early version of the game, you know, I, I always listen to folks... Uh, when they ask me about the things that they want to do, because that usually leads me to some really interesting places. And with this tactics prototype, you know, folks were asking, like, well, what happens if we, like, use our cards to, like, push other characters? Or, and, you know, once I started putting pushing into the game, well, can we push them off the table? I'm like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And so over time, this thing sort of evolved in kind of three major stages from this uh, Final Fantasy line battle kind of style to something kind of closer to actually uh, Triple Triad or uh, Tetra Master if you've played Final Fantasy 8 or 9. Uh, and then the third iteration really was this final like arena combat that best it basically was Super Smash Brothers. Oh, okay. Yeah, that that is a journey indeed. And I imagine that the reason why you had originally called it Tactics is because of Final Fantasy Tactics. Yes, definitely. Okay, good. Because see, I know a thing or two about video games, Alex. Um, <laughs> if you say so. Yeah, it's it's sort of my forte. Um, but okay, so that's why we started with kind of like the the eight bit style. Because uh, I mean, the characters are all like just from the initial box art are are very colorful, and it it makes me feel like how many characters do you actually have that you can that you can be in the game. Um. Play? So. Players actually get to lead uh, multiple characters, so you actually lead a whole team of monsters, so you always get six characters. You get five monsters and a unique captain. So there's 24 characters then in the game, uh, six characters for each of the four teams, uh, with more teams that I'm playtesting as potential expansions. Ooh, okay, excellent. Uh, and uh, when you were creating them, because, again, as I said, some of them are look really really interesting um how the development process to make these characters uh what was that like so, some of them seem like you 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 had to be like into the good stuff in order to get to in, <laughs> in, in order to get to these designs um Are you insisting well, like uh <laughs> like what, what sort of things like a, or rather which designs i'm curious which designs i see a uh a, a like a cat I'm thinking that it must be two different things because I see uh, like a striped cat and he has a paw on top of what looks like a really sleepy uh, crab 
And I'm, <laughs> I'm wondering if that's one character or if they have like a symbiotic relationship to each other or if like they're <laughs> telepathic. I'm not sure. Don't I'm not sure. The, vult the vulture looking uh, condor bird that's going after the cat. In the, uh, and he's bird. poking. That, that is a real life tweet. That's how they tweet now. The, the bird just pokes you in the face. But yeah, I'm wondering how, like, how did you design these characters? Was there any inspiration behind the uh, the overall design of them? Yeah, so I mentioned 16-bit RPGs as kind of a driving force in the early prototypes, and that was really sort of uh, my own, you know, my own selfishness of like picking things that I really enjoy and really love doing because uh, pretty much one of the few constants with all the different stuff that I make is that I really love monsters. So I have comics that involve monsters, I have games that have monsters now, and uh, lots of other fun things. Uh, but the kinds of monsters I enjoy, uh, you don't see a whole lot. Like it's, So I wanted more monsters that were cute and weird and a little offbeat, uh, rather than like scary or intimidating or cool looking. So for me personally, that touchstone is like Dragon Warrior monsters, which I played a ton as a kid. Of course, Pokemon. Okage Shadow King, uh, you know, just all of these like really creative designs and then making those your team. So rather than just being these faceless uh, uh, goons that you're like destroying, you actually get your own little crew of characters to fight with you, which for me is much more appealing. So the I, actual. I do like that. Yeah. Um, so the three characters you were mentioning are actually each from a different team. So that little moon cat, that's the moon familiar. So there's a. Uh, so the moon character, the main captain is uh, Luna Umbra, who's got sort of a witch vibe going on. And uh, the moon theme itself is kind of this nice intersection of magic and witchery and space as well. So there's actually a couple other uh, referential characters in the moon team as well. Uh, I don't know if, if you noticed the uh, Starman. Uh, yes, hanging off the table. I see him. So, uh, the, oh, okay. So, so in that the the teams are set. Like it's not a mix and match. I have a team of six, and they represent something. Yes, they are your whole team, and all of the players are basically using their captain and their monsters to fight their friends and kick them off the table. And uh, all of them are fighting around this singular tile in the center called the Heart of the Battle. It's a magical heart shaped trophy uh, that is only for the bravest and boldest of warriors. Uh, and only one player is going to get to take that home. So all of you are trying to keep your team and your captain alive and knock out all of the other teammates, uh, everybody else on everybody else's team. If you can knock out a player's captain, you knock out their entire team. Uh, but to counter that, every captain gets special game-changing powers that they can use to have dramatically different play styles. And this is really where uh, that synergy between those characters comes in. So uh, for the sake of balancing, the moon team is always set because... The way that the moon captain plays is dramatically different from the mermaid team or the sweet team or the spooky team. Oh, okay. Okay. So you so it's kind of asymmetrical in that way. Very much so. The way that I design the game, and this is the way that I like designing a lot of tabletop games, is to have the base level game have maybe a little bit of differentiation, uh, a, but start more or less on even ground. So uh, the, in, in Tiny Sword Smash, uh, the characters have each character has a different speed and a different uh, rock, paper, scissors type. So there are uh, some monsters that they're going to be stronger or weak against. Um, but for the most part, those those levels are about the same. Uh, the characters, uh, all the characters in each of the teams have uh, two monsters with each of the different rock, paper, scissors types. So you always have at least somebody that you're going to be strong or weak against. And the, the speeds are basically about the same even uh, for those characters, but the powers are really where it diverges, and that's, for me, what gives the game longevity. Uh, being able to have something that can be approachable on the surface, that can be uh, set on even ground, and then when you feel confident enough in those rules, then you can start turning them inside out. Okay, I see that. Uh, so now, now I'm now I'm really intrigued, because I kind of understand the, the idea of the game, but I'm not quite sure how I'm playing the game so uh, imagine you're not you're not playing the game you're looking at it going i wish i was playing this game that's exactly right but let's just i'm gonna throw something out let's sure. imagine i'm stupid <laughs> shut up imagine <laughs> let's let's imagine i don't know how to play games again shut up alex and 
uh, explain basically like what is my turn going to look like? How how am I going to start playing the game? Sure. So uh, I already mentioned that you have a team of monsters at your disposal. So every player gets to lead their own team, whether it's the moon team, the sweet team, spooky or mermaid. And all of those teams have six tiles. So you have your captain and you have five monsters. And each of those tiles it can be laid either face up or face down and changes during the game. Uh, and when a tile is face down, it creates a wall. It's a brick tile uh, that basically can't be moved around by anybody else in the game. But when a character is face up, it can move and attack other monsters that are face up. So you can choose whether to create defensive blockades or be able to get up and out there. And of course, there's limits on how many of those you can turn to blockades. Um, but during the game, all of you are basically uh, assembled around this heart of the battle. So sort of imagine a, uh, a line of tiles connecting your character to the heart. And as long as you can make that line of tiles, then that character is safe. They are, uh, if we were talking about Smash, they'd be on the stage. They'd be uh, safely on sa solid ground. But, of course, only one team is going to get to take that heart, right? So it's whoever is last on the table. So during your turn, you get to take actions to either save your monsters or put someone else's in danger. So let's say during your turn, you decide, okay, well, I want to uh, move one of my monsters around. So you have a monster with a speed of two, so that character can move up to two spaces. Doesn't have to move all two, um, but they move up and over and they slide and they push all of the face up tiles in their way. So if yeah. there is a single face down tile in that direction, it can't move. It's for all intents and purposes blocked off. But if it's all good, and you can push all of those monsters in your way. So you could slide five, six monsters in one row if they're all lined up. And you can do some really fun combos with that. So let's say that you move your character, you slide over, you get to take your second action now. So you could move again, you could flip, or you could smash. And smashing is how you really get people uh, in danger because you get to attack somebody. And every time you attack somebody, you get to add damage tokens. So these little pink tokens with either a one on the, or a two on the other side shows how many damage points that character has. So let's say uh, you have a monster that's a rock and your opponent is a rock. So it's a normal attack, so you just put one damage token on that monster, and they haven't gotten any others yet, so they're pushed just one space away. Now, the thing is, is that, uh, like in Smash Brothers, every time you attack somebody, that character will continue accumulating damage. The only way to get rid of that damage is for that tile to flip face down. Otherwise, uh, the next time you hit that monster again, Say uh, you attack with the same character again, so it gets a second token. Now it goes two spaces away because it has two damage tokens. And then, let's say you have another monster, it's a paper type. That monster would be super effective against that rock monster. So you attack, add two damage tokens. If it already had two before, now it's got four. So that character and any other face-up tiles that are in front of it are all going to get pushed four spaces away. And if you can knock a tile off the board, then they're gone for good. They're knocked out of the game permanently. Ah, okay. So that's my goal. I gotta get. Mm -hmm. I gotta get the team <laughs> gone. Right. Away. And there's there's one more catch too, because even oh, if you boy. don't knock a monster off the board, if mm -hmm. they're totally disconnected from the heart, then they're in danger. And if they mm -hmm. are in mild danger, then that means that they're basically hanging onto the edge. They can be touching tiles, touching the heart, touching by the corners. So corners aren't wholly safe, but they aren't like completely dangerous. But that character at the end of that player's turn will start taking damage. So if you don't take care of them, they'll start getting more and more vulnerable and it'll be a really tasty target for somebody else to knock out of the game. And uh -huh. if that character is completely disconnected, if they're not touching any tiles that are touching the heart, that character is in grave danger. And that player has until the end of their turn, their upcoming turn, in order to save that monster. So say if you knock a captain and say, uh, and, and this is the beauty, the thing that I think is like the most fun part of, of playing this game, is that you can either play with this board that ships with the game, or you can get a special cloth mat, uh, tablecloth actually, that I'm developing for this game. So you can literally turn your entire table into the game and create a huge space to play on. Oh. So you could do the same thing. So, but let's say, you know, you can, like you say, like you have a table that's like 20 squares long or something, you, you swing and you hit a character and, you know, there's no limit on how many tokens you can put on a monster. So you could, I have had players actually hit monsters out 15 spaces at a time, <laughs> but no matter what, that character still technically has a chance to get back. But if that character, say, can only move like three spaces at a time and they're pushed 15 spaces away and they have only until that turn to get back to the heart character's probably not going to make it. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And this is where you get some of the really fun stuff because, of course, as the characters, as the game progresses, it gets harder and harder to keep on uh, top of all of your monsters. And it's very easy to damage monsters and kick them around and kick everybody else around, too. Yeah, yeah, I, I see that. Um, and uh, now, now, as I'm looking at a general layout of the board, though, uh, everything isn't going in straight lines. You can you can go in, uh, in in every which way and create some wonderful Tetris style pieces. Uh, so so how does that actually work when you go and and push somebody? It, it, are they going to get pushed down like a a kind of like a, a right turn left turn sort of way? If you push them away? Uh, basically, your character will move and any face-up characters in front of you will get pushed along. So imagine almost like a sliding block puzzle. Oh, okay. okay. So if your character moves up and over, then you know if there's a character in, in one of those spots, as long as they're face-up, you can nudge that character out of the way. Okay. And if there's an available space for them to go into, they get nudged in that direction. Exactly. Oh, and as okay. long as there are no face down tiles, you can push all of those characters. So face down uh, tiles are that that's the trade off is that you can only have so many of your characters face down, but those wholly stop characters from moving, period. No questions asked. Oh, okay. Okay. So I was wondering, you say you, you push the monsters. Do you actually have to be physically like right next to them moving to push them? Yes you do. So there's not you don't have like an attack range. When you push a monster, like you say you can push them fifteen spaces out. You actually have to have one of your monsters like right there pushing them along. Exactly. So any monster that's in your basically touching your sides is is basically the way that you attack. And attacking is of course different from moving because moving you can you know, some characters are gonna have an easier time moving around. Uh, but attacking is great uh, in the long term because you get to start stacking up those damage tokens and you get to keep your monster safely put wherever it is. So so wouldn't, if you have uh, pushed a monster 15 spaces out, that means you've probably got a monster right up there with it. Wouldn't that put them in danger as well? Potentially, but that's one of the beauties is that you don't have to push them, you can attack them and that, that shoves them all the way out. Okay, so it's kind of like a knockback effect. It's you shove them and they just kind of go flying. Exactly. And that's what the damage tokens shows you. Is every time you add on damage tokens, that shows how many spaces that character is going to get pushed away from you. Is it cumulative? So if someone's got, mm -hmm. you, you said someone's got two damage counters on already and you hit them for another uh, one or two damage, they'll be pushed back the total of all their damage counters? Yep, that's correct. And the only way to get rid of those tokens is to flip your tile face down. Nice. Uh -huh. okay. So, it, is there any restriction there? If I have 15 damage tokens on me, mm -hmm. is there anything stopping me from flipping face down? Well, the same rules that apply to everybody else, which is that no matter what you do, by the end of your turn, you need to be connected to the hearts. If you're not touching the hearts by the end of your turn, the character is dead. Yeah. Just dead. Just mm -hmm. dead. Dead. Just dead. Zed's dead. Mm -hmm. And so is your character. Everybody's Believe dead, in Dave. Believe <laughs> in the heart of the game. Yep. And that was a big development for me when I was uh, making this game, because originally I didn't have that, but I needed some kind of... Uh, essentially, I was trying to think of some kind of gravitational force. Because I wanted something that would encourage players to kind of continually push themselves into conflict spaces. Because otherwise, you know, of course, the similar, the, oh, there's a lot of folks who would rather... Uh, play as defensively as possible so they would r push their characters as far away or like just like look go as as far away as possible and of course that leads to a stalemate and doesn't make for a really satisfying or interesting game mm. so this heart uh, was kind of the the simplest way that i felt could be done because then one it's a goal that everybody is reaching for two it's a very easy visual uh marker so you can basically see okay is my tile touching tiles touching the hearts no Okay, that's uh, all you need to know. And then it also c continually adds drama to the game because, of course, as players start eliminating monsters, there's fewer and fewer ways to connect to the heart because there are less monsters around. So players are scrooching in closer and closer, which means that that inevitable conflict only escalates as the game progresses. Right. Basically, you've created a way that forces them to continually push into the middle of the game instead of trying to play around the outskirts of the game. Exactly. That's, that's always a good thing in an arena combat. Because, like, in Smash Brothers, you can go all the way up to the other side of the map. 
Mm-hmm. And then someone's going to follow you there if they want to do anything, or hope the environment is you. Which, to be fair, is how I like to play Smash a lot of times, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's good times. I, I always wait until I get, like, Donkey Kong to, like, 350%, and then if you just, like, smash a hammer on him, he just goes flying off the board. That's always fun. Get the baseball so- bat. So um, probably the most ridiculous uh, Smash story I have is actually I was playing uh, with a couple of friends on my birthday and uh, a friend of mine had gotten me the Wii U one. So we were actually playing an eight player Smash Brawl on the uh, the Kirby's The Great Cave Offensive, I want to say. So for anybody who hasn't seen this stage, it's basically this winding labyrinth of caverns with like little like lava uh, spots on the walls and the ceilings. So if you touch those, then there's like a ton of like fire damage and stuff you can get. And uh, I was playing uh, actually with a little Wii mode, so I didn't even have like a full controller. I was just using this little like Wii mode as pick- as Olimar, and I was playing against a friend of mine who, bless her heart, uh, she is a professional Smash player. But uh, like we were playing with items, which was you know an eight player stage on this giant giant place with items was just like the most ridiculous chaotic thing. But she's an excellent player, and she made it all the way to the end, and it was just me and her. And so I'm just dashing around trying to avoid her and trying to figure out, like, how I can, like, stay alive enough to, like, damage her from a distance. Uh, and I end up just, like, looking at, like, these little capsules and just, like, shaking everything I can just in case there's something good I can use. And I basically, like, she's, like, trailing behind me and both of us have, like, 300% damage. So whoever, like, touches the other person is going to get knocked out, right? Right. So I, like, throw this capsule and it gets me a power block. I just slam it down and it just happened. Just so happened that uh my friend had her character i think she was playing uh ike or somebody it was it was a like a a pretty high tier character or something i think um Mm -hmm. one of the fire emblem characters i'm pretty sure but she was right below one of those lava ceilings so when the pow block hit the entire stage shook so she her character got launched right up into the ceiling and it was this beautiful thing where she just had this like this ridiculous pinball effect she was just bouncing between (laughs) this wall between the wall and the floor just perfectly up and down like rapidly for about like five seconds and then just zips right off the stage (laughs) well that's that's one way to win a game (laughs) it was it was a beautiful thing and i am my my only regret is that the uh stage uh like the replay editor didn't get to actually save it yeah, oh. that's unfortunate. But I used to like the Fire Emblem characters, even though like I couldn't reference what they were from, except I played Fire Emblem, but they're it's different casts every time. <laughs> but mm. uh but I liked the fact that they had swords and they could jump really high and and they did a lot of damage when you <laughs> hit people with them. Yeah, so I mean swords I are cool. Don't get me wrong. I, yeah. the, the characters are fine. Uh, as far as I'm, I mean, I don't play competitively Smash, so I don't know what the tiers are right now. I just uh, yeah. personally, when I play fighting games, I very much just love playing weird characters. So uh, yeah. with like Smash, I love playing as Pikmin or Wario, Captain Falcon occasionally. Um, yeah, and then like, uh, oh, my God. And also this most recent one, the uh, oh, my God, the uh, Duck Hunt characters are just like the oh. most ridiculous like duo I think I've ever seen in a fighting game. Yes, I I don't know if I can quite get behind the Wii Fitness. <laughs> oh, that was my I, other favorite one. Yes, Wii oh, Fit Trainer. Is, what she, I love her. I, I I sat there and I thought <laughs> this doesn't seem like it works. It's like I don't know if yoga. Like I don't know how this works in the in the game. <laughs> but at the same time, okay, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, that one and and uh, the kid from uh, Mother uh, Mothership. Mother, or mother two, mother two. Sorry. Oh, Ness. Yes, Ness. Yeah, I used to like Ness. Those, uh, those games that no American has ever actually seen. But you can buy them if you have a whole lot of money and can get <laughs> and get a or, regional specific console. <laughs> or if you uh, just go on the eShop or something, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think they actually made one you can get on the eShop. But yeah, no. Uh, Earthbound was available. It has been available for a little bit on uh, uh, Wii U Virtual Console, and I. Th- think the 3ds one as well don't call me on that um but uh well actually i mean this is a good topic anyway because mother the mother series was actually a pretty big influence on the monster design for this game oh good good i i mean i kind of saw some of the characters and i saw just kind of elements of it and i thought to myself kind of like ness it kind of reminded me of it 
Um, but at the same time, like I see the I see ones that look kind of like bloopers that have uh, boxing gloves on them. Like they're really surly bloopers that spent like a little too much time they were at the pub a little too long <laughs> at the underwater pub a little too long and they were like i'm gonna find that mario and i'm gonna kick him <laughs> like they just they, they just look like surly uh you know like the characters from from uh from from, from mario so oh yeah those are the uh the mermaid fighters and uh oh good. yeah yeah that, well that was the thing for me is that i didn't want to limit myself to kind of uh, borrowing from one particular influence because I'm I'm much more interested in sort of crafting a general overall vibe, and for me I don't want this to be this thing that's like oh it's just Earthbound as this thing, but uh, for me it's not like specifically about that. It's more calling from a variety of sources and kind of uh, mingling it into something new. But Earthbound was definitely an influence uh, visually since the uh, sprites. A lot of these tiles have these like abstract backgrounds, which was a thing that I really liked about the uh, Earthbound battle system. Uh, with these like colorful like abstract like swirls and uh, stripes and like other patterns and it was a really nice like unique thing that I hadn't still haven't seen in too many other RPGs and that was a thing that I definitely wanted to like bring into Tiny Sword Smash. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I kind of like that aesthetic, and it also makes it really easy for me to tell like whose team is whose. So that yeah, that was another big thing was uh, the design of the tiles definitely shifted as. I uh, was interested in basically making the game as visually readable as possible, especially because it is a little bit, it's, you know, I, I like to think that the games that I make can be a nice bridge between uh, Scrabble and, like, the hardcore tabletop games that a lot of, like, folks have in the, in the tabletop community, and there's a lot of really, really brilliant, interesting games, but it can be a little bit daunting for a player that has only known, like, you know, maybe they've played Catan, maybe they've played, uh, like, a Stratego or something. And so uh, mm -hmm. one of the things that I really want to make with these games is make something that's friendly and colorful and interesting. And that's actually one of the big reasons why uh, when I was designing the manual for this game, I, I spent like about, uh, I think I, I think I ended up spending about two and a half months, if not three months, just on the manual, just for the writing and illustration. So the, the manual is uh, has tons and tons of illustrations of just cute little doodles of monsters uh, and just like little diagrams and lots of little things. And I was, you know, specifically also referencing like old video game manuals, but for the, for the same reasons that I want that in a board game, which is that, you know, a, a video game manual from that era was very much interested in getting you invested in the world and explaining the concepts, even though they might be abstracted in the game itself and making it as approachable as possible. And that was the thing that I really want for board games as well. Yeah. I feel like video games no longer come with manuals. They don't. And there's, <laughs> you know, th there's a good and bad with that, which is the one thing that is nice is that most games now basically have their manual and tutorial built into the game itself, which is a lot nicer in a lot of ways. And also, you know, I, I personally, I love the aesthetic. I actually have a, uh, a manual on my desk right here, which was actually a big visual benchmark for the Tiny Sword Smash one. Uh, it was actually, this is actually kind of a funny thing anyway, because... It's the Japanese manual for the Game Boy Color version of the Pokemon trading card game. Oh. So it is, <laughs> yes. it, it is a manual for a video game based on a card game <laughs> that I used as influence for my tabletop game based on a video game, like video <laughs> games in general. Um, <laughs> but the thing that I love about this particular manual and the things that I really wanted to steal from it uh, was exactly the kinds of things uh, that I love about old manuals when they do work is that uh, the the manual like this particular one has a cute little comic uh, frame story. So there's like a cute little comic about a kid who like has a, a rival friend and he like wants to learn about the Pokemon card game. So they like have this professor character show up and they like walk through the first battle and they have lots of little diagrams and uh, there's tons of cute art of the characters, like there's a whole page of like status effects where the monsters are like dizzy or poisoned or burned and they have like all cute little like uh, chibi style effects. And it was like mm -hmm. just really fun and entertaining to look at. And it's just really clean and exciting. And, you know, it's it's one of those things where like even if I don't have the game or haven't played it, like it makes me excited about that. And so that's something that I really wanted to capture, something that I think is like really valuable uh, for especially for tabletop games, because you know, on the one hand, like, uh, video games have that advantage of being inherently electronic and virtual and interactive, so 
it's nice to have that, you know, the game basically process a lot of that stuff for you. But with a board game, you know, the player is the computer. They have to learn how the game works. Mm -hmm. So you have to teach the player how to be the computer. You have to make it exciting for that player. And uh, the best way to do that, at least for me, is pretty colors and cute doodles and silly monsters doing cute things and uh, all those sorts of things that like I, I would love to see as a kid. Right, right. Yeah, that that does seem like it would be the harder limitation of trying to teach people the game uh, over an electronic format, because in electronic format, you can just have a character come on and say, hey, here's how you put on your clothes, and <laughs> now here's how you hit things with a sword, and then they say, just hit this button, and the sword comes down, and you're good, and I can mm -hmm. get that. But, you know, when you have to visually represent it for people, uh, that does seem like, like the harder thing and we talked to a lot of people that mostly said that it takes the majority of your time just to get the rules written <laughs> mm -hmm. in the first place so uh speaking of time frame um how long did it actually take you to from from the initial concept design mm -hmm. to uh the version that you actually put on kickstarter uh what was your time frame for that Let's see. So the original prototypes of the game were developed in January 2016, which shortly after my first Kickstarter game succeeded. Uh, so that was a card game, the original Tiny Swords, that this is sort of spun off of. So oh. that game was a rock, paper, scissors style card fighting game uh, with cute pastel swords. So every uh, team in Tiny Swords Smash is based on a sword theme and aesthetic from that game. So in that game, there was the spooky sword, sweet, mermaid, moon, and a bunch of other swords that I designed for it. So then I could take those aesthetics and concepts and translate them to other genres. So I was really interested at that point of making another game in this like tiny swords universe, so to speak, but to have a game style that was different. So something that I could build out and like have as like a full universe. And so uh, January 2016 was when I started playing with the prototypes. So I had a bunch of different game genres that I wanted to play around with. Uh, and this tactics game was the one that uh, the people I was testing with were the most excited about. So I ended up kind of focusing on that and fix, uh, pushing towards that. And I, I actually originally launched this game as Tiny Swords Tactics in uh, October 2016. Um, so most of that was final. The manual wasn't final, but most of the assets and base rules were there. And then, uh, unfortunately, that campaign uh, didn't fund. It was in the middle of the presidential election, among other things, which I think just led to a really unfortunate timing. But mm -hmm. I wanted to try it again, so I took a couple months, took some extra feedback, worked on the manual and more packaging and things, uh, really to try and spruce up the uh, outer appeal of the game. And launched again in, uh, let's see, what was that? May 15th? May 13th, I think. Uh, so I had that set up. So yeah, about, a, it, it's been about, a, it was about a year and a half development between then and now. Okay, okay. That, that's not too bad. No, no. Uh, I, I've, I've heard uh, longer from other people. <laughs> so that's <laughs> not bad. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, the other thing, too, was that this game I really wanted to uh, take that time on because the first game was kind of a sprint. Uh, the original Tiny Swords game I created, like, mm, June 1st. I, like, wrote the game on Twitter. Like, I was just, like, out late one night with some friends, and I was, like, I literally, like, wrote a tweet that was, like, I want to make a tiny card game about tiny sword fights and tiny swords and, like, all caps. <laughs> and it was, like, okay, here's how I would do it. And I just, like, sat down. I had, like, flashcards and all this stuff, and I was, like, okay, great. Let's just go ahead and make this prototype. Um, but the, it was basically after I did a couple months of like prototyping the cards, I was like, wait a second, I could actually like kickstart this. This, this might be affordable enough. I could do that. <laughs> and so, so basically it was about a five month, uh, sprint from concept to Kickstarter to completion. So that oh, one wow. was, uh, and, and that was just, uh, designing a ton of sword cards, a ton of rules and extra game mechanics and some fun stuff like that. So it was. Yeah, June 1st for the original concept. I had a prototype ready in a couple weeks and then spent the next, like, the couple months of summer making new swords. And then October, like, October 15th was when I launched that Kickstarter. So, and then shipped wow. the game and had that ready to print by December, like, Christmas, I think it was. So then, like, ship. Yeah. So I wanted to take some time <laughs> after that game to, like, okay, let's decompress. Let's see what we can do if we have, like, a full year to make a game just mm -hmm. to, like, so just to just to stretch ourselves a little bit, make a bigger game, make something a little more complicated, make something a little more full. 
Uh, and right. so that was uh, what became Tiny Sword Smash. Beautiful. Beautiful. So uh, did you take any of the original, aside from the aesthetics, uh, did you take any of the original like mechanics or the workings of the first game put into this one? Not in a literal sense. Um, so there is a rock, paper, scissors element in both games, which is like a, a loose connection. Um, although the effects and the styles of those are, of course, different between the games. Um, but really what I was more interested in was the general feel of the games, to have sort of a uh, a game that felt like a Tiny Swords strategy game. And, and so the original Tiny Swords card game was this very quick, fast-paced, rock, paper, scissors card game with customizable swords uh, that was very approachable and very accessible, even playable without a table. And I wanted to basically take that feel rather than any specific literal mechanics and translate that into other genres and styles. And so that was really what I wanted to take from one game to the other. And that's uh, so, uh, for example, in the original Tiny Swords, every sword uh, you get to customize has a special charm card. So you get to add a charm card to your hand that adds special rules. And so this was for me kind of uh, distilling the essence of what I, I thought was interesting about like collectible card games was this idea of like building a, a sword or a deck in this case of like six cards that has some functionality and then also like some aesthetic and like some interesting little mechanical twists. And so that was the same impetus for designing the captains in Tiny Swords Smash, uh, but having more complicated, uh, challenging abilities, but still keeping a general vibe. So, for example, the sweet sword in the original Tiny Swords has a sweet charm that's a little uh, milkshake. And that milkshake is a charm that you can use to swap cards with your opponent. So at the start of every round, you can use this card once, and you get to choose a card randomly from your opponent's hand and then give them one of yours. And you can do that every round until that charm is taken out. And so for this game, what I wanted was to have basically some, excuse me, that had something of a similar vibe, but applicable in a strategy setting. And so that became this idea of, okay, well, if you don't swap cards, what if you swap tiles? So in Tiny Sword Smash, the sweet captain uh, is a character named Marshall Latte, and she's this little, like, uh, desert wizard. Uh, so she has these abilities uh, that allow her to uh, teleport all over the place so she can, like, zip past and, like, put herself next to another monster, and she can have... Uh, monsters that can and her monsters can actually swap places with other people's tiles so instead of swapping cards you get swapping tiles and so going forward that's sort of the idea the identity that i want to craft for these different aesthetics of not necessarily literal mechanical uh exact mechanics from game to game but just this flavor like the the way that i like describing it honestly is the sort of the logic in like mario brothers games and mario like spinoffs where like once you understand like okay mushrooms make you big mushrooms are good things stars make you invincible and then you go to any other mario game regardless of what context it is if it's a mario baseball game and you see a star you understand okay well that's going to be a really really good thing so i should go for that even if it's like maybe it's not like in super invincibility or something or like it doesn't work the same way then at least have some expectations set right right exactly so uh Okay, I I get this. I get this. So you're you're kind of creating like with the original like Tiny Swords and with Smash, you're you're creating like your own uh, sort of a world around uh, your game design. That's what I'm hoping to do, and uh, I I like to say that although it's, I think there's a certain expectation of like universe building that I think is a little more literal than what I'm going for. Mm -hmm. um so like and again this is why i like using mario brothers as an aesthetic and as an example because the mario brothers universe is not a very it's not it's a nonsensical universe deliberately so you know it's something that's inspired by one alice in wonderland and old japanese fairy tales and like is just this anachronistic mishmash of like all kinds of different things and you know it's this kind of question of like well if like bowser and mario are enemies like why does he keep why do they keep inviting him into parties and it's this sort of thing where, like, you know, it's more like the uh, the Osama Tezuka, like, star system, or, like, you know, like, I like the explanation of Miyamoto that they're all actors. So this is, like, what they do when they're not, like, putting on a show or something. And uh, right. that kind of, like, more abstracted universe still has its own inherent, like, interior logic. Um, but it's a very dream logic. It's very, like, uh, loose. And so that leads to uh, the ability to surprise which is, I think, the thing that yeah. I'm really interested in is the ability to like constantly have new surprises and interesting things. And that's more, 
you know, it's not, I'm not trying to build like a Dragon Age Thetis or like, uh, you know, an expanded Star Wars universe or something where I'm like, here's the 6,000 year old history of like all these characters and like here's like their whole interior life. But more, more like uh, that, where the other, the other games where, you know, this is, okay, if you see this character in this game, they'll have this similar personality, they'll have these kinds of relationships with other people. And if you see these kinds of themes and aesthetics, then you'll understand that the kinds of powers they have are going to have these kinds of different things. So like uh, Mermaid has like, you know, things related to uh, waves and confusion and uh, sea, uh, the ocean and stuff, and like sea critters. And Spooky has things about hiding things because the Spooky Charm in the original card game has the ability to hide characters where the uh, Spooky Captain, uh, Polly Geist, in this Tiny Sword Smash she has an ability called Jump Scare, which allows her to scare people out of hiding. Ah, uh, I see, I see. Well, that that's good that you're not trying... I think it's actually good that you're not trying to do, like, Thetis with this, because, uh, <laughs> one, uh, boy, that would take a long time. But also, two, you're just going to open it up to a whole bunch of game theorists who are, <laughs> who are going to pick it apart <laughs> immediately. Well... I'm sure somebody is going to do that anyway. I mean, I mean, well, again, yeah. you know, the, there's the <laughs> folks who are like, if if people can make videos about like, uh, is Sans Undertale like supposed like really Ness from Earthbound? <laughs> like, oh, there's nothing yeah. stopping people. But you know, that's kind of the fun, honestly, is like seeing like how people interpret those characters and see like what they do with them. And then that's, I think, uh, the thing that I'm excited about personally. Yeah, yeah, uh, and and uh, I mean, I kind of like the. Most of the time, you see a lot of people when they try to do like the the rock paper scissors sort of groups. They usually just uh, use something like elements, and I kind of like the idea that like one of them is about mermaids, and one of them is just has lots of candy and stuff. I like the sweet captain for that oh, very thank you. reason. Yeah, <laughs> I do. Um, and uh, now, uh, I, I imagine there's been quite a bit of playtesting. Um, have you had some like standby playtesters that have uh, played multiple games that you've been able to to see through the evolution of the game? Yeah, um, actually, one of my housemates, uh, Pete, who is actually sitting next to me, is uh, we're recording this interview. Has been uh, a really Hi, big help Pete. for that. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Uh, he's got his headphones in, but I'll make sure he uh, knows he said hello. Um, but yeah, Pete uh, was a big help with uh, early playtesting, and so he's seen a lot of the different versions of the game, and he was also a big help with the manual. He uh, actually used to work as a technical writer, so uh, you know, after the first draft that I go through this manual, he goes, all right, here's like 5,000 words you can cut out of this, and here's like <laughs> some ways you can reword this so it's not as awkward, and just uh, uh, he's been a big help, and I have had a lot of folks from that uh, in, in that circle that have been very helpful. Uh, so, for example, I live in Portland, Oregon, and I'm part of the Portland Indie Game Squad, which mm -hmm. is uh, primarily video game based, but there are a couple tabletop folks like myself, but it's a community in Portland dedicated to bringing together different developers. And so last summer, I did a bunch of tabletop events and uh, went and uh, did playtests with folks and uh, got advice from folks. And uh, usually those were some mostly the same folks that I saw week after week, which was nice because I like having that mix of folks that uh, are completely new to tabletop games and others that design games or they're experienced gamers. Uh, because for me, like, I want to be able to get that range of experience to be able to have something that can be approachable but can still have like that long lasting appeal. Beautiful. Um, and uh, when you had those play testers, because they, I, I imagine that they've tried some of the different groups, and, and all of your, your different uh, teams have some different abilities. Um, did you notice, be, I only say it because this would have been me, mm -hmm. once you get used to playing like the mermaid team, and then you go to play the sweet team, do you try to play it like the mermaid team, and then you have to like rethink your entire strategy in order to, to do it? Did you notice that with your playtesters? You know, a little bit, yeah. And and that is, be, uh, I would say, the two most popular teams are really very, very different. Um, so I would actually say the Spooky and Moon teams, uh, aesthetically at the very least, if not mechanically, are like some of the, like, the, the popular choices for players. Mm -hmm. And ooh, what's interesting for me is that Spooky has this whole thing around uh, character, like your character is basically going around to interrupt like defensive maneuvers. So your captain is jumping around and like using jump scare to uh, attack monsters and flip them up. 
And then uh, the spooky monsters have an ability called Ghost Walk, which actually allows them to walk straight through face down tiles. So basically, any kind of defensive ploy is like very, very useless against those monsters. But the Moon Team, on the other hand, has this whole thing uh, called Lunar Phase, which is a really unique one even in Tiny Sword Smash, because it's actually an ability that affects everybody uh, on all teams. So you actually have these special Moon Tokens uh, that come with the game specifically for these abilities, because what you do is uh, when your Moon Captain flips up, you actually choose one of those Rock, Paper, or Scissors types, and you give a token to every monster on every team with that type, and that gives them a special plus one speed. Oh... Hmm. Okay. So there's okay. some interesting strategy there because, uh, and two things actually. One, there's the obvious, okay, do I power up my captain or do I power up like my other teammates? Uh, and there's a little bit of weight to actually go for the latter because there's a secondary ability called Solar Flare. And so your captain is a rock type uh, for the moon captain, Luna Umbra. But these other characters that you have, if you choose scissors or even paper, something that would be directly like, uh, advantageous against your captain, then they actually gain a special ability all of their own. So you actually can choose one of those types, you give them the tokens, and then your monsters get a bonus extra ability to push face down tiles. Oh, okay. Okay. That so it makes everything a lot more interesting. <laughs> yes. Yes, it does. Um, yeah, th this, this is what I meant when I said, like, these, these rules completely, like, invert and restore the entire game which is exciting but i want to make sure that players are coming from you know a, a place of confidence and competence when they get into this stuff and part of that is having like that sort of baseline like okay these characters kind of have the same sort of vibe but i like this aesthetic so i'm going to go down this path and see what happens and then whoa okay yeah this is completely different like all these characters <laughs> were completely different right so uh basically what you're saying is uh the first time i play i might not want to be moon team because I'm not. This seems like the advanced team. What well, you, not yeah. if you're playing with Captain Powers, but that is a thing where you know if you're playing for the first time, I, I do encourage players to stick to those basic rules just so they feel confident with those. Mm -hmm. um, I do. I, you know, like I said, Moon has been a really popular choice. Uh, Spooky and Moon have been like the two most popular teams. I want to say for the the games, even with uh, newbie players or advanced players. So I'm I'm curious to see, you know. I'm I'm curious to see how that changes in the future. If because uh, I, I do want to make sure that these characters, you know, all the, all the characters have like interesting abilities and fun abilities, useful ones. So I want to see kind of how that meta shifts. If uh, that meta shifts, like as the game, as players like get used to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, because I mean, I I don't know. I think that uh, everybody should just play the sweet team for the simple fact that I mean it, they've got shakes. First of all. And it, there's candy. So really, uh, I mean, th that's a no-brainer. Just go <laughs> for that. Right, Alex? So, Why wouldn't uh, you want play that? This, you play the sweet team against spooky team because obviously the spooky team is going to try and go trick-or-treating. That's true. The sweet team is going to poison the candy. And ghosts <laughs> like candy. We know ghosts like candy. That is that's, a proven fact. It is it's science. A proven fact. Yeah. So somebody once told me that. Oh, oh there's going to be a game theory about that too. Um, so. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. So now, how now since since all the teams do do different things, um, mm -hmm. how different is a game between four players and a game between like just two players? Very, very different. And mm. is, this is actually where a Smash Brothers analogy is extremely useful because it is literally, in a, in a lot of ways, it is very much the difference between playing one-on-one -on -one Smash and playing four-player Smash for all, free-for-all. I get you. you know, it is, it's very much the same kind of thing where you know, a one-on-one -on -one has a lot of uh, ability for strategy and careful thought and uh, there's a lot of like kind of uh there's there's a lot of uh, strategic play and there's like a lot of uh, back and forth and aggression whereas a uh, four player game three player even is just chaos where players are just pushing everything around and you're attacking left and right and it's really fun but it's a very different kind of fun uh so i like yeah. having those options for players because i know that there are players who would prefer like that more subdued strategic cerebral experience and then other players like me who just really want this like absolute chaos uh, like get as many of their friends involved as possible. So th that's actually part of the reason I developed a couple extra mechanics. So there's actually ways you can move the heart uh, during the game. Oh, okay, okay. So basically, you, the center of your board shifts. 
Yes, it can okay. shift. Uh, so yeah. this is, and it, it kind of came out of this loop of the different mechanics that you have available, and it just came again out of players asking questions that led down interesting paths. Uh, so for reference, uh, I mentioned already during your turn, you can take uh, an action of like flipping or moving or fighting. Uh, and so, you know, there's this sort of thing where it's okay, you flip a character down uh, and you can't move, push it, right? But let's say you throw somebody and they hit a wall, they hit a face down tile. Well, what happens then? And, you know, for a little bit, it, I, I did play tests where I was just like, well, nothing happens and that's fine, but it's not that interesting. And it doesn't really encourage the kind of gameplay that I want. So then I started playing around with some other ideas and it became this idea where you crash into the tile, which makes it really exciting because now when you attack somebody, you throw them and if they hit a wall, they stop moving, they take extra damage, and the face down tile flips face up. Oh, okay. Okay. So again, it's this thing where a lot of the captain powers and a lot of the mechanics are kind of in this way of encouraging uh, excitable, aggressive play so that players aren't uh, like turtling the entire time, they aren't slowing the game down, uh, they're spending more time like going after other characters rather than trying to kind of uh, huddle up and make sure that their characters are safe. There's really no safe place in like this air in this game. Um, but then the, those same mechanics right come with the consequences of like, okay, well, what about the heart? The heart is treated as a wall for all intents and purposes in the game. So what happens to the wall, the, the heart? And so like I've actually like had to rein that back in because originally the heart just stayed face up the entire game like any of these other tiles. Um, but of course this ended up with this like it almost too far, too far on the chaos level where a uh, chaos meter where players were using the heart and then they were just shoving it around the board and the other players were just scrambling to keep up. So if you had uh, like a really fast character that can move through your four spaces at a time, then you could actually destroy the entire game just by moving this heart out of the way. And so uh, mm. I wanted to keep some of that chaos in, but not have it as a, a sustained thing. Having as a temporary like burst is really exciting, just enough to make it interesting. So now the heart flips down at the end of that player's turn if you crash into it, and that's the only way that you can get into it. And so uh -huh. players are, again, encouraged to move towards the center of the map. They're encouraged to attack other players rather than playing defensively. Uh, they're encouraged to basically manipulate the entire battlefield. Uh, and they do lo lots of really fun stuff with that. And uh, just all these little mechanics kind of working in this like nice little circle uh, is what really makes it exciting. Because once you understand those three basic ideas and just how they interact with each other, that's really the, that's the core of the game right there. And that itself just leads to a lot of really interesting uh, outcomes. Yeah. So, so what happens if you flip the heart upside down? So if you flip the heart face up, then it becomes a face up tile. It, it's treated like any other face of tile where you can actually shove it around using your characters. So even though you can't push it directly, remember how I was talking about how when you move, you get to push all the face of tiles in your way? Heart mm -hmm. is no exception, but only if it's face ah. up. So how would you turn it face down again? So the heart always turns face down at the end of that player's turn. So that is okay. an automatic rule, no questions asked. Oh, so, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. What happens if I attack the heart? Then you would push it away from you. You would uh, add damage tokens, just like any other monster. Uh, in this case, you would add two damage tokens each time, uh, and you would get to shove it that many spaces away. What happens if I shove the heart off the table? <laughs> That's what I was gonna so ask. if you shove the heart off the table, so in the course, because I had players who would do that, right? So I have to figure yeah. out, okay, well, now what do I do? Um, <laughs> so the rule that I decided was that if you shove the heart off the table, uh, the player after you gets to decide where the heart goes, and that counts as the end of your turn. Hmm. Oh, okay. So, so I can't just blow the heart up and say everybody dies. Nope, unfortunately not. That's how However, you if you push it, <laughs> if you push it just up to the edge, if you get it right up there, then you can throw everybody else for a loop, and you can uh, push everybody else around. That I think is even more fun because now everybody's scrambling to stay on, but they're also right on the edge of the table. Um, that's true. That's that's also fun. Uh, yeah, because at, at first when I thought about like the heart and everyone trying to get to the heart I thought of it like almost like king of the hill and now it's like kind of king of the hill if you had dynamite So so that's that's more exciting uh, And maybe that's where the smash comes in. I feel like, oh definitely <laughs> I feel That's where the smash comes in Yeah, I mean that's that's the idea of the this is why I like describing it as a smash brother style game because 
in a lot of ways, it is very much the spirit of Smash Brothers as a board game. You know, it is an arena combat game where players are encouraged to constantly move towards each other. They accumulate damage that push them farther away each time. Uh, you know, the the details are different, of course, but like the spirit is there, which I think is really the uh, the heart of it. Yeah, yeah. Now, had you ever considered, uh, and and this is the kind of question that I would come up with, um, mm-hmm. had you ever considered uh, multiple hearts? on the table. I did consider it. Uh, the problem became that it was difficult to determine who was safe. And it's a question then of like, what does that add to the game? So if I'm adding, uh, one of my friends likes to use the sentence of like, it adds complexity, but does it add depth? And uh-huh. I could see that potentially adding depth in this idea of you get sort of like these little mini planetoids uh, that players are fighting on, but you get kind of the situation that I originally had with the heart, which is, you know, what happens if uh, like a player like two players basically end up like on opposite islands and they have no reason to get back to each other. Well, what do you do for that game? Because unless you come up with some reason for them to move together, they're just going to stay as far apart away from each other as possible. Right. Right. And that would be, uh, that, that would be my concern. Cause I did do some play tests with that. Uh, but uh, unfortunately those were the kinds of problems that I ran into. Hmm. I, I almost feel like when you said planetoids, like that would be a solution for it, is if you had the hearts have a range of tiles that they extended their influence to, and outside of that, things weren't safe. Mm. Um, and then if you were to like push the hearts around so they're in each other's range, they would get closer and closer until they like collide. Mm. Certainly. It could be interesting. I mean, I could see that being a, a new game. Yeah. Yeah, it it does seem like at that point that's almost a completely new game <laughs> in, its, mm-hmm. in its own right. Um or or you could have them push further and further apart and uh then it would be like a, a colonial war and you could see if you could actually occupy both of the hearts at one oh, time. Geez. Oh yeah. my god. But in a two player game, I imagine mm-hmm. that's just one player huddling around one heart and another one huddling around another heart. <laughs> So, yeah, that that would be sort of my concern. And you know, even a four player game eventually it gets knocked down to uh two players. Two. So Yeah, absolutely. Although um one of, and this is like another thing that I added to this game because I wanted to keep uh players playing but also just have like some extra things to like keep the game going, uh are these block tiles uh to add to the game. So after a player's been eliminated, they can start controlling these little block tiles that they get to set down on the board. And they are these little brick walls that act as walls. But instead of uh, being like player characters, they can't attack anybody, but they can basically just shove stuff around and just be super annoying. But the other cool thing is that if you smash into these walls, you get to flip them once and it cracks the wall. And if you flip them a second time or if you smash them a second time, that tile is taken off the board, put back in the brick tire brick player's hand. And that character, the player, whoever smashes it, gets an action token. So during the game, uh, whenever you lose monsters normally, you gain this action token that allows you to take an extra action on your turn. And so uh, there's this extra kind of flow, uh, some like extra like exciting like changes. So if a character like loses one of their monsters, then they get a token and they can go, oh, well, wait, well, I can use uh, this action, this action, and now this thing. And I can use that to get my revenge. And it becomes this wonderful pendulum swing where you took out one of my monsters. So fine, I'm going to go over and I'm going to heck up two of your monsters. And now this other player goes, hey, you hecked up two of my monsters. I'm going to go back and heck up your captain. And Mm. this pendulum swing goes back and forth to make the game exciting and escalating even as uh, the game uh, progresses by the end. Even though there's less monsters on the field, there's more excitement going on. That's cool. And it kind of keeps everyone engaged to the end, too. So I like yeah, that. and that's uh that's always a benefit for me of like those kinds of uh like arena style or elimination style games is like having something that gives players a reason to stick around. Mm-hmm. And it's nice also because these blocks also allow players to kind of uh not so not as much a king making strategy, but allows them to influence a little bit. So if there's somebody that like ganged up on them earlier, then they can push all the blocks in that direction and you know, or like push the blocks towards the other player being like, Hey, you should break these blocks, just get take uh, some extra tokens. <laughs> so so that's fun and uh and you, you might not have friends at the end depends on how it's played but you know it, it's fun while it lasts <laughs> I, think, I think that's important I, um, I have been told it is very much a uh this is very much a friendship destroying game yeah which i'm, yeah. I'm very proud of oh, that's good yeah <laughs> i mean i mean it takes a very special game to destroy long-term friendships 
<laughs> he really does. Usually, usually it's Monopoly. <laughs> usually it is Monopoly. Oh, uh, <laughs> yes, it is. And at least uh, I will say the benefit of this game is that unlike Monopoly, this game ends. Yes. <laughs> yeah. 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 People. People who who know anything about games know Monopoly never actually ends. Uh, until I get all the hotels. But um, and even not then, I will not stop with the hotels. Um, now, uh, you you had mentioned earlier too um, that you were playing around uh, with some other potential teams, mm -hmm. maybe down the line. Um, now, I, I I imagine like w would you be considering that for like having more players involved or just having more choices for the four players involved? Um, so that's actually one of the things that I really like about that tablecloth that I designed is mm -hmm. that it allows for a lot more players without like crowding the board out because the this board that ships of the game for obvious reasons, I can't ship a board that's like four or five feet long, you know, um, but yeah. this tablecloth, you get this wonderful thing of like being able to actually fit a cloth over your table. So you're literally pushing tiles off the table edge, mm -hmm. which is like super fun. And then you have this extra space to play around this. It's very easy then to imagine like having these extra like fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth teams to add on. Now, how well that would do with other players. Now, I have had I have had eight player games. I will say that, and they have uh, been obviously a little bit longer than the four player games and two player games for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but that has definitely been like some of the funnest stuff that I've seen uh, because it is just adding extra chaos on top of everything else and especially mm -hmm. because these particular captains that i'm looking at for these new powers are very much even wilder than these teams that i included with the game so for these expansions you know i'm very much interested in just pushing this uh this style of gameplay as far as i can go to just see what kind of weird stuff i can do uh, so just as an example uh one of the teams that i unveiled for the kickstarter is the sushi team so the sushi sword was actually not in the original kickstarter uh tiny swords card game um, so it's one of eight new swords that I designed specifically to do expansions for all of future Tiny Swords games. Mm -hmm. So the Sushi Sword has a captain uh, named uh, Nori Bancho, and she has her own sushi team of little uh, sushi monsters. So there's a Sushi Dragon and a Sushi Lion, a Sushi uh, or a Sushi Tiger, and a uh, Sushi Spider. And these different uh, sushi characters, they actually have an ability called Conveyor Belt. So they actually have little arrows on the sides of the tiles. Uh, on the front side, and what you do is when your tiles are face up, then those characters actually can shift the entire row of tiles wherever, whichever way their arrows are pointing. Oh. So your tiles actually now can rotate, and that actually matters uh, for this particular team. So you actually can have characters rotate and move entire rows of tiles at once. Wow. Okay. So th that that is an interesting strategic element, uh, and and a very annoying one if you're playing against them. Um, mm hmm. And for for everybody involved, uh, and uh, and and just uh, briefly, the other ones were uh, circus team, clockwork team, and the robo team. Yes. Okay. Great. So theoretically, down the road, you could be looking at eight different teams that could be played by theoretically eight different people at the same time. Theoretically, in fact, uh, I mentioned earlier that each one of these teams is based on a sword from the original Tiny Swords card game. Mm. So that card game had twenty different swords in that oh. game. And then I have eight more swords that I designed, and I have rough, some mechanics, some themes are more developed than others. Um, but theoretically, you know, assuming that I don't develop any more swords, then there could be a total of 28 different teams for this game. Jeez. I feel like that would be a very large table needed. <laughs> it would be very exciting. I, I, would, I would love to see that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a meat hall table for you <laughs> that uh and you'd need to develop a very large tablecloth <laughs> well the tablecloth i've got uh is actually a yard long so i i think uh that might just be enough not bad not bad um but <laughs> the I, I, 28 person game is the one you have multiple hearts on oh yeah lord that would be something yeah it's like when you see those giant subs you need a tablecloth to fit under something like that that's and fair. That's, you'll just, be all set. that's just your uh, that's just your bib. Your bib <laughs> is a tablecloth. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that would be, uh, yeah. Uh, don't get up to from the table too fast, or your entire game will just uh, fly right off with you. Um, yeah, that that would be an interesting 
uh, idea. I don't think I want to meet the 28 people that I'd be playing with, though, ahead of time. I feel like that. I, I'd want that to be a like a secret. I don't also know 28 people, but mm. if I did, <laughs> that might be fun. Well, um, you know, it's like the uh, the people who got together to play the biggest game of Carcassonne, right? You know, they had like uh, 500 tiles or something on a giant table. So that's oh. kind of what I, I, I like to imagine the future, just like 30 different people getting together and be like, hey, let's just put like four of these tables together and we'll just have the biggest game of Tiny Sword Smash ever. That That's, that's, that's one for the convention hall. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it also seems like the longest game of Carcassonne you'd ever play. <laughs> <laughs> oh absolutely yeah um now see so so we've we've had the original card game and now we mm -hmm. have the the tile game with smash wait sorry <clears throat> smash there we go uh i have to do it that way you told me um but uh i i i see future with the tiny swords as, as a franchise uh i'm thinking maybe maybe go in the dragon age uh, and and do like a super like in depth role playing uh, tiny swords. <laughs> why not? Why not something like that? I you could know? see it in the future. Um, yeah. To be honest, like the closest I think that I have or want to get to that as like a dream project is actually doing a Dokapon Kingdom. <laughs> that would be interesting. Uh, just just in general, how do you see that playing? <laughs> oh, uh, as a Do are you familiar with Dokapon Kingdom? Hmm. So uh, uh, no, for, no, for no, anybody no. who's listening who hasn't heard of this game, uh, basically imagine the love child of Monopoly and Final Fantasy. So you have these little like JRPG style adventures running around this game board kingdom, and each of those players are trying to save as many of the towns as they can, because every time they save them, they get to claim them as property. And mm -hmm. by the end of the calendar, whenever you start this game, then whoever has the most money gained from towns and fighting bosses and everything else uh, is the winner of the game. And true to that JRPG form, there's towns, there's item shops, there's magic shops, there's subquests and side quests you can take on, there's secret boss monsters, there's all kinds of classes and hidden uh, secrets, including uh, the, the class system is actually based on like combining all the different, like leveling out the different classes. So like the first three classes are just like the rogue, uh, warrior, and mage. But if you like complete two of those classes, then you unlock a special like new class. And then once you complete all those other classes, you get to like start combining them. But it is this labyrinth of a game that I was obsessed with in college, and my friends all love this. We love playing through the story mode. And it took us like four months to play through the story mode. But you know, if you're asking me sort of what the like penultimate, like the uh, like the like m big epic, like my uh, the opus of Tiny Swords, it probably would look like that. It would probably look like. That. <laughs> okay. Okay. Fair enough. It does make me start thinking, Alex. I think I have a new game for you to develop, and it's it's oh it's 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 like a tile game, but like a role playing tile game. And you would you, you said would you come... couldn't do that. I want to though. And I said, who said you couldn't do that? There's no reason you can't do a role playing tile playing game. You could. You could. It it might take forever, and you'd probably need an even bigger table. I think you would. Because you have to visit towns and dungeons, and those would be tiles. I could see it working out. I, I believe in y'all. Yeah, yeah. You shouldn't, but <laughs> but but we appreciate the comments. <laughs> I'm not the designer. He's the designer. Uh, so you could put that in with all the other projects that that you have to work with. Yeah, all, all the things mm -hmm. I don't have time. Yeah, exactly. To do anything with all of those things. So Nathan just wants a tiling city builder RPG. Pretty much. That's cool. Can I have Can I have Sim Tile? That's what I want. Oh, sim it, Tile. It would, it would be Civilization meets Pandemic meets uh, D and D. That sounds, that sounds terrific. pretty rad. <laughs> yeah, that, sounds, <laughs> that sounds kind of awesome. <laughs> we should totally do that. Um, but I'll, ha I'll have it on your desk by uh, Never. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At Never o'clock. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see what I come up with while I'm working overnights. So, uh, Alex, uh, how big is your sword? Uh, bigger than yours, and that's all we're going to talk about. That's all we needed to talk about. Uh, so, Alex, uh, for all the folks at home, if they want to find more information about Delve, where can they go? You can find more information about Delve over at delvecast.com. 
And while you're there, make sure to check out all of our Dell developer diaries uh, and uh, some uh, other cool stuff that is going to be coming in the near future. Uh, Brian, if the folks out at home want to learn more about Tiny Swords Smash or or the original Tiny Swords, uh, where could they go on the interwebs? They can go to brianwolfstuff.com or they can follow me on Twitter at brianwolfstuff. Brian Wolf Stuff. That is very concise. I like that. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter while we're at it. Uh, I am at Citanium. I am at EXP Limited, and the show is at Dell Podcast. Yep. So if you have any questions uh, about that uh, Dragon Age slash everything else that we were talking about, which we won't do, feel free to contact <laughs> us there. And, uh, and of course, always, you can find us on Google Play and iTunes. Please rate and review and subscribe while you go. When you go. You're totally going to go. Where uh, you go. Where you go, when you go. The links will be uh, below on the site. Uh, and uh, we're, oh, yeah, and we are also starting to put episodes up on YouTube. So you might be listening to this on YouTube. I don't know, but I hope you are. Uh, and so with that, um, I feel like smashing into some other things, uh, probably not in the tabletop, uh, genre, uh, maybe just, uh, with, with an actual, uh, smashy thing, like a hammer or a bat. What do you, what, or a car? Yeah. Is that what you like to smash with? Yeah. Great. Good. Uh, that bear learned a very valuable lesson. Uh, yes. Uh, so... Uh, Brian, thank you so much for joining us today uh, and on, on fairly short notice. Yeah, well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate talking with you all. Oh, uh, it was a, an absolute pleasure. Uh, the game looks really cool. Uh, I'm glad that it got funded. And uh, good luck for the future of uh, Tiny Swords the Saga. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a saga by Tiny the end. Tiny Swords Universe. Tiny Swords Universe. Tiny Swords yeah. Go. <laughs> Let's make Tiny Swords go a thing. Oh, uh, boy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you come here, we give you more projects to work on. That's what that's what we're here for. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so, everybody, uh, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.